what I want to get across is that if we are interested in water security, uh, and I think we must be, uh, I realize in Canada you've uh, got so much water that water security doesn't seem to be an issue, but there are places where agriculture is impacted on water quality and industry is impacting on water quality, so there are hot spots everywhere. But, but if, what I want to get across is that there is a food chain, that um, the majority of water that we a food supply chain that we need that we need is in this w food supply chain. Ninety percent of the water that we need each day or each lifetime is in the food that we eat. Uh, most people don't realize that. Most people outside this room don't realize that and most of you probably when you came into the room didn't realize it. So if uh, the, the people that um, use that water in productive purposes um, are involved in this massive proportion of the water that we need, we perhaps should begin to understand what they think, what they care about, whether we're giving them a chance to be more productive than they've been in the past. And we also need to know about the food supply chain, and the trading that we're going to be talking about, but also uh, the consumption at the other end, and whether the people at the, we at the consumer's end, are behaving in a way which is consistent with global food security. And I hope at the end of the half hour or 40 minutes you will agree that, um, that, uh, that this has been worth the journey. The icons before were just the, the commodities of food, the, uh, the, the good stuff, the stuff with the hearts on it, the, the, the grains, the wheat and the rice and, the, and, and so on, and the not so good things such as the beef and the other livestock products. I'm not going to suggest you become vegetarians, but it would be good if you consider, could consider the footprints that you have, because just to give you one little shock right at the beginning, um, if you eat a lot of beef, your water footprint per day is five cubic meters of water. If you're a veggie, it's only two and a half. So I'm not saying anyone should become vegetarian, but since beef is pretty bad for you if it's eaten at that sort of level. It would be wise for your own sakes and for the environment that a little bit of collective awareness went into your shopping um, so that we can, uh, in fact, not go down to two and a half, but just to three and a half. When I gave a talk similar to this in 2008 uh, to a very short uh, after dinner session, I <laughs> helped, been helped to coin another little uh, um, maxim which was down from 5 to 2.5 and it moved a few people and as I was coming downstairs an American uh, who'd heard this little rhyme uh, said would, would 3.5 do and of course yeah 3.5 would be wonderful it would save an immense amount of water if, because in the, the overdeveloped uh, world in which we live in Canada and the United States and other uh, new liberal political economies. Um, we we are the people that are, have the opportunity to choose to um, overeat and, and spoil things for for everyone. So, uh, using the lens of virtual water to throw light on water security and a lot of invisibles um, uh, that we need to come to terms with if we're going to communicate with each other um, and perhaps move our own minds and, and the behavior of farmers and consumers and uh, just I'll harp on the issue of managing ourselves if we're part of this very long important elemental food supply chain elemental that is in its relevance for water security um, since I'm in a university, I, I should um, indicate that there is a history to the idea. And in fact, the idea was coined by a, a, an economist, uh, an Israeli economist, who dad, sadly died before 1990. Um, uh, and he uh, pointed out that in this extraordinary political economy of Israel, um, it was foolish that they should be exporting huge amounts of water embedded in, uh, in the food commodities which were part of their food trading system. Uh, just to give you a sense of the volumes of water involved in uh, food uh, production, it takes a thousand tons, a thousand cubic meters, I'm metric, I can't do acre feet and things, so I'll just stay metric, I believe you're supposed to be metric, so um, I'll just take advantage of that. Um, a thousand tons, a thousand cubic meters of water to raise a ton of wheat. It takes 16,000 to raise a ton of beef. So 
So we have the idea of the of the water footprint. So if uh, in obviously a ton of wheat is <laughs> worth less than a ton of beef, and there are a whole lot of economic variables in there that need to be looked at. And of course, a ton of oranges and a ton of avocados are, are, have, have different footprints. But clearly, uh, if you're in a water scarce country, and Israel imports probably 80 to 90 percent of its food uh, to be exporting water in relatively low value um, commodities, and that there's very, uh, very few agricultural commodities that are high value. Uh, it, for a good agricultural economist such as Gideon Fischel, so he did draw this to people's attention. And, and in fact, Israel has since then, by 25 years after that, um, <laughs> the amount of water going into the um, exports is much reduced, and also the water that is going into those exports is mainly reused water. I wish I could give a lecture on reused water, but it isn't <coughs> the topic for today. Anyway, <coughs> in between about 80, 1988 and, and, 2000, and 1990, I, <coughs> I came up with the idea of embedded water. And it's uh <coughs> an interesting lesson in terms of research in that <coughs> by 1988, 1990, I was well through my career and certainly at that stage had not produced an idea that anyone had taken a second thought about. Um, and, and even when I spotted this, I didn't give it too much thought. But I realized that Gideon Fischelson's idea was, if you turned it on its head, <coughs> and since my, I'm very privileged to um, work in the places that I have, and mainly in the Middle East, I uh, realized that the region um, was being frightened by people saying there will be a water war, there will be lots of water wars, uh, because uh, of the, if you're a determinist, you would say that if you run out of something, eventually you'll have to go to war. Well, I found, if you looked at the recent history of the Middle East, um, there were water wars, briefly between 1962 and 1964, between Syria and uh, Israel, and they both zapped each other's tractors with either um, artillery or, or jets. And it, no one, I don't think anyone got killed, but it certainly was a, it was violent um, conflict. And since then, and before then, there has been no armed conflict over water. I'm not saying there is not conflict over water, and I could give another three-hour lecture about conflict and water and how the different types of conflict that exist and their, and their different intensities, but the, the highest intensity armed conflict doesn't exist. Failed states even don't go to war over water. Farmers will kill each other over water, villages will uh, have little wars over water, but nations do not go to war over water yet, uh, in that one has to be aware that uh, there could be something that might happen that one has not foreseen. But then I had to explain in the circumstances of the Middle East by, that by 19, at the end of the 80s, uh, despite people like the, king, the then King Hussein and Butrus Ghali, Butrus Butrus Ghali of Egypt were saying there will be a water war <laughs> and they were saying it for internal consumption reasons, not necessarily for international message reasons. Um, that one had to explain why there was no sign of war and the population had doubled, so things had got much worse. <laughs> and I found by looking by chance at the import figures for Egypt that the, um, uh, the f f uh, just looking at wheat and flour, I found that they went uh, very steadily for decades and then in 1972 or so they started to rise very rapidly. Uh, there was a political thing behind that. And the other thing that I've got to emphasize throughout this talk is that start with the politics because you'll find explanation there rather than with the technic technical issues. So the, I'd found that by importing food, uh, and therefore having embedded water in it, you could solve your water security problem. And I started to try to publish, but I remember at that stage of life I was doing what many of you are, thank you for coming at all because I'm sure you've got 18 hour days and here you are just listening to this. And I was at that stage in, in the early 90s and trying to, and I, I knew I should publish it. Um, and so I wrote an article and sent it off to Water International, which is not the, the highest rating, rated uh, journal in the world, but it's getting better. Um, and I was told by one referee that it was a stupid idea. And so I was, I, I was, I was old enough by then to know better. 
<laughs> like, this is a stupid journal, and, and I was so busy, I just then left it. But fortunately, the water community, like you, are <laughs> all honorable people, and they, they let me keep the idea despite not publishing it. So I didn't really, I really knew it would become important when Aaron Hoxter, who figures in all the rest of these citations, from the Netherlands, Delft, from a very respectable hydraulic engineering modeling uh, background. Um, when, and I know f from his other work that he was a serious person. When he wrote to me and said, you know, where did you first publish this? And I, because he said, I've got this editorial in groundwater or something, which, and that was the first time it was published. But, so I, I didn't do the professional job at all, but uh, it clearly has proved to be a, uh, an important idea in that I find I'm quite, you know, in that uh, academics are not, uh, um, don't have terribly rich lives in terms of recognition, but I do get quite moved when um, one knows that every uh, water minister in the world now knows the concept of virtual water. They may be still uneasy about it, but uh, I know that the, every chief executive officer of the, of the main brands knows about it. And then you go to meetings and you find, you know, much better dressed people than us, you know, standing up and using extraordinarily powerful prose, using the idea of virtual water and water footprints to, to communicate their stories and their difficulties and how they're using the idea to help understand what is happening. So from uh, 1999-2000, when um, Aaron and his, uh, his graduate students, mainly at... Um, in Delft, worked very diligently using whatever databases there are globally, which are never very reliable, uh, but uh, I'm not a modeler. I wish I had time to do a thousand different things, learn Chinese, become a modeler, and so on, but because modelers are precious people. They have such courage. Uh, they have to you know, dis you know, decide that this assumption is, is going to be good and stay, and uh, the numbers are going to come out. But the most powerful, one of the most powerful parts of my experience is as the consequence of starting to put numbers on it. Uh, politicians need numbers, chief executives need numbers. Uh, they, need, they, they, they need the power to reject the numbers, but they need to have numbers that when they come they can, they can use for their purposes. And so there is a great hunger for numbers out there. So be good, be assured if you are a modeler that you have a, 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 an advantage position because there is this appetite for numbers because we educate people in places like this and we have respect for numbers and we assume that if a number is published that it's had an awful lot of work put into it and the integrity of the researcher is sound and so what, what I found was that when the numbers came out that, uh, the idea suddenly became a much more concrete thing and I knew the numbers weren't all that good, because uh, when you have been in a game for a long time, you, you have a sense of what's a, a good number and a bad number. And um, uh, the, 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 this experience was very strange, because I had guessed that we needed about, estimated, uh, uh, we needed about 1,000 cubic meters per person per year as a, for our food, and perhaps another 100 for the other stuff that we'd need, and perhaps there must be another 100 for other jobs and so on uh, that we're associated with. And I came up with a number between 11 and 1,200 cubic meters of water. I never put that in print, but I just had a feeling that this was um, about the number. So when Aaron came up with his first models in uh, 2000 and 2001, and he, he said that the average footprint for an individual across the world with poor countries and rich countries and all that taken into account was 1,200 and I think it's 53 or 1,226. The number will come up in a moment. So I was, what do you do? <laughs> when was it guessed a number, which then an awful lot of number crunching has gone on. And I, I have to confess, I didn't, I didn't question it. But on the other hand, I did know that when I looked at Libya, when I looked at Sri Lanka, when I looked at two or three other countries, which well, the numbers weren't as good as they should be. I always wanted Aaron to call his first numbers and his second and third numbers, first and second and third approximations. That's this is a very good advice. If you ever got uh, um, something which is likely to be important, but you know in your bones that the assumptions are not good enough. And just to give an example of the assumption, 
that uh, if you're doing a job like that with a few months rather than a few years, then you've got a range of data coming from um, the World Trade Organization and FAO, and certain assumptions about evapotranspiration, which you need to use to get some sense of how much, uh, <laughs> how many crops are being raised and what the productivity is. And you then can either uh, do sort of a lumped model where you do the whole country or you try, you, if you have more time, you have a, uh, <laughs> a distributed model. But he didn't have time to do a distributed model. So it meant that he had to put a number in for um, <laughs> evapotranspiration. And he chose to put in the number for the capital city of the country. Well, that's fine for Belgium and Holland, because uh, the whole country is pretty much the same, but it doesn't work very well for the United States or China or other very large countries. So um, I did find this later on a problem. I meant to bring some copies of my new book, but I'll, I'll leave them uh, afterwards. Because um, when I was writing a chapter, um, or a section rather, I thought the book deals with three uh, <coughs> rich economies, United States, uh, UK, and Spain, uh, three, two BRICS economies, um, China and Brazil and three developing country economies, Egypt, um, um, Ethiopia and uh, Vietnam. And when I was uh, starting to do the, uh, the Spanish section, I, I, uh, I looked at some numbers and when you, this book's for the popular, general, general reader, popular book, it's got no citations, so I'm trying to make it accessible and I, I found that California and uh, Spain are about the same size, they've got about the same populations, um, they've got a, a number of other things in common. And then if I looked at the water footprints for the two countries, it's, um, they were the same as well. Uh, that was fine until uh, uh, about three weeks later I went to a meeting in which we discussed Spain with people that had used different data and we found that the Spanish footprint was, was half the one that, that Aaron had ca calculated. So, and that was because they'd used a distributed model and they used a different assumption about evapotranspiration. So, the problems of getting to a good scientific position uh, is, are obviously very numerous, but my purpose today is to make sure that uh, you do need to know those underlying fundamentals, and I'd obviously go to my death to protect the right of people to look at the underlying fundamentals, but decisions in the political domain are rarely made on the basis of underlying fundamentals of numbers, whether they're hydrological or economic. Uh, you can ask me questions if you wish later on. So these are just a few, um, thank you very much, a few uh, slides to indicate uh, the footprints of uh, the world in that case. The top three lines are and blobs are the internal water footprint, uh, that's the domestic needs, the top one, the national water agricultural product footprint and the national water industrial product footprint. And then the two bottom ones are the trades uh, of in agricultural products coming in and the foreign water industrial products coming in. And so for the world you can see there's quite a bit of trade going on, uh, but you also can see that if you take the second top and the second bottom, that's you know, those are agriculture you know, for food, uh, you can see that it's by far the biggest uh, footprint, as we would predict from what we've been saying. So that's the average position. Sorry, wrong one. Yeah. So this is a poor country, Tanzania and Africa, and you can see um, the, you might think, oh, well, they'll eat less, and therefore their water footprint will be smaller, but in practice, because uh, they, their water, uh, f the, water, the food that they eat is produced on farms where the productivity is very low, they've got a rather large water footprint. Um, Later, very little to do with industry and very little trade. If we then go to one of the BRICS economies, um, Tanzania, uh, two tens of millions, India with 1.2 billion, uh, 1.1, 1.2 billion currently, going to be 1.8 billion uh, by 2050-60. Uh, so it's a, a country to watch. We pray it stays vegetarian. Uh, whenever I meet Indian friends, I always ask them, are you and your family going to stay vegetarians? Because um, the extra half a billion um, people that are going to be around um, in the next tech decades clearly need a footprint of at least a thousand cubic meters a year. And you can see <laughs> India is, um, trades a bit and has a bit of a bigger industrial footprint. Then Brazil, another BRICS economy, about a tenth of the size of um, 
15% uh, of the size of India, uh, but with massive water resources, a big beef eating capacity, uh, which you can see from its food footprint, it does a, a lot more trading as well. And then the United States, your neighbor, you can see which is a very uh, typical industrialized country profile, but with twice the average footprint of the world. And you can see it does eat an awful lot of beef and it also imports quite a lot of food of um, various sorts, sorts as well. So the United States is an extreme example of, of uh, 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 <coughs> consuming uh, an awful lot of water via this food supply chain. The global position is interesting. This is the national water use for domestic use. And you can see Canada top left with the United States um, uh, quite clear, Australia you can see it, but you can also see the shape of Africa and you can see that clearly the domestic water footprint of rich countries is uh, quite dramatically bigger than uh, Tanzania which is, sorry, 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 sorry. I can't see from here, so I'll, let's, let's forget that. So anyway, the, 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 the domestic water footprints are um, very small for Tanzania, where you can see on the right of, right of Africa. And but then the, you can see, you would expect the water footprints for food to be smaller, but in fact they're bigger, and that's because of the productivity of the farms in Africa. And I will be spending a little time on that to make sure you've got that particular message. So these... This, this part of the talk is just trying to show you you can have metrics about embedded food and you can also uh, have quite a lot of interesting metrics about trade. There are about 210 economies in the world. Many of them are very tiny. Some are very large and some are very rich and some are very poor. Um, we are used to thinking about asymmetry of power in relation to energy because the 15, 20 or so oil gas um, um, surplus countries uh, do uh, get into the news and they give us anxiety because of the threat to our energy security. But in practice, the asymmetry between the water-rich, food-rich, food-exporting countries and the rest is even more asymmetric because there are about 10 of them only. And you are obviously one and the United States is another. Brazil is a, the potentially the biggest of all. It hasn't reached its potential at all yet, and other South American countries are in a strong position, although there are one or two that, that aren't. But South America is the water tower of the world, and you obviously know that better than I. Uh, but I, one, as a Middle Eastern specialist with a lot of knowledge of Africa, obviously can only look with envy at um, uh, South America and its riches in water. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> a lot of it can't be used. Um, one of the things I've, I'm not, I used to be a bit of a hydrologist, and, but I, 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 one likes to think one can spot things that other people haven't thought about. And have you noticed that the heavy lifting in terms of water use is done by the rivers that flow north-south? The rivers, the rivers that flow east-west, such as the Amazon and the, and the Orinoco, which does the same sort of thing in, in, in Brazil, it's got you know, 8,000 cubic uh, kilometers a year of water in the Amazon and um, the Orinoco and the other rivers are at least 1, one to 1 1.5. But the, the Congo, which is east to west, the Ganges, which is west to east, and the Yangtze, which is east to west, because they flow through wet places, they get water all the year, or pretty nearly all the year. And, but for some reason, must be the soils or the people or whatever, only the Ganges is used to any extent. Um, yet if you think of the north-south rivers that c come from wet places through dry places, like the Nile or the Aral Sea rivers or the I Indus, um, you find that you know, they're all um, being dried up because, and they're often very small. They're not these big five, six or seven rivers. They're, they're on, only 10% of the size or even less of those big rivers. And yet it's those rivers that do the heavy lifting and the ones that we're drying up, they're the hotspots. So getting back to the, where we started, 90% um, of the water is managed by farmers. Engineers get a lot of credit for doing it. They get too much perhaps credit. Um, they, they do manage the blue water. The water that can be pumped from the ground or from the river is obviously managed by, by engineers. They can 
uh, pump it and they can store it, they can divert it, um, and they can treat it and lots of other things. Um, but in practice, um, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 it's the farmers that have to manage both the, the water when they get it and, and mix it with all the other inputs. And of course, the majority water that produces our food is still the green water. That's the water in the root zone, which comes from the rains such as we got last night, which stays long enough in the root zone uh, for the crops to uh, use it and utilize it and evapotranspire. So we've got 70% of the food produced from the green water and 30% um, <laughs> from, the, from the blue water. And this excellent diagram by Peter Rogers of Harvard in the Scientific American of a couple of years ago uh, gets, gives us a sense of the green water environment and the blue water environment and how little of that um, environment Little, the, the, we, this blue, green water is very important, the blue water is very important too, but the green water is where the majority of the agricultural production comes from. It, uh, you can't necessarily get such high yields from green water. Uh, you can, supplementary irrigation is always the temptation that leads us to uh, use too much water. Whenever you irrigate, you always run out of water, everywhere, always, always. Um, in the UK, We've got potential of 5%, we normally irrigate 3%, and the area where we run out of water is where we irrigate. It's always the temptation to irrigate is too much. We should hesitate, or we should have hesitated to irrigate. Um, and the, uh, also the green water doesn't sound as if, perhaps you've never heard about it before, but it's so important. Because with farmers who are well motivated, protected, and encouraged to be even better with their agronomy, they can increase the productivity of water unbelievably. In the UK and Northwest Europe, in 1800, we used to get one ton of wheat per hectare. In 1900, we would be getting two. By 1950, we were getting three, which seemed good even if it wasn't good enough, because as Malthus had predicted, it wasn't good enough and the population had risen four times. Uh, but because of what was done in terms of governance, incentives, uh, protecting the farmers, giving them uh, from the, the market and from, from, the, from the weather, uh, by 1990, we were getting 10 tons per hectare. So what is water security when you can get from the green water 10 times what we did in the past. Now, I'm not saying that the places that are getting half to one ton now, such as much of, uh, of Africa in the, um, the um, savannah zone and, and neighboring parts, and I'm not saying that that can be moved to 10, I'm not saying it can be moved to five, but it can probably be moved to, 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 to two or three or a bit more. And that's important because the African population is going to double. So what I would like to see you go from here, knowing that green water is important and because farmers manage green water as well as blue and because the productivity that comes and the production that comes from green water is just as economically important as that that comes from blue water, we should not ignore the green water. <coughs> what I want to do next is just give you a bit of context on where we've been over the past um, 50 or 60 years and this is what one litre of water produces, um, one litre of water produces one calorie on average and what the story has been in the different uh, uh, parts of our global economy. So we've got, this is the level at which um, the threshold for national food security and uh, we can see that the rich world has been happy and overeating or let's say we, we started to overeat in a big way by, by now um, the other parts of the world have done quite well. Um, Asia has done extremely well, but Sub-Saharan Africa has not done very well at all. So there's clearly some potential uh, to be achieved there. So w will there be enough water? Well, if you had 10 different people here, they'd all give different stories. I'm a dangerous optimist. I think there is. Uh, 
it's going to be tremendously challenging to get us to achieve a sustainable further intensification. We've achieved this miracle of 10 times the productivity of water in some areas in the past 200 years, and it doesn't mean we can uh, do it another 10 times in the next 200 years, because it would be uh, obviously beyond, beyond the capacity. But there are still improvements taking place, but we've got to make sure that they're sustainable and that they're not doing damage to the environment. So we've got um, more people. Um, more calories of meat and fish and milk uh, to be eaten by more middle class people that are going to be around. Um, <coughs> there's, we need, some people say, to double grain production. These slides, these are the next, the past two or three and the next few are from uh, David Malden of the International Water Management Institute. And I'm surprised to say that, because I, I, when he speaks otherwise, he normally talks about 70%. I say we need to increase by about 40%. Um, other scientists say 70%. And the pessimists who want to get attention say 100% doubling of, of food production. So that means there's going to be more water for food unless it's by um, intensification. And so we need to value water and understand it. So we need to know where the water is. We need to know that the green water is valuable. We have to recognize that it can't easily be valued in a price sense because everyone thinks it should be free. And you don't care as consumers whether it's you just want to have the food. But um, if you ask farmers to pay for green water, they won't. Uh, if you ask farmers to pay for blue water, they will be unwilling and to resist it uh, uh, to, to, to just absolutely successfully nearly all the time. And you know, how, how difficult is it to get people to stop using blue water? Well, think Australia. Australia has had a long drought and it was having to face up to the facts of environmental life. It happens to be uh, rich because of its minerals. So it has a federal government which can uh, address the problem. Um, the, it's very common, I dare say it's the same in Canada, that the provincial governments, uh, state go with sub-state government levels, um, all run agriculture. And so for 150 years, um, people have been running it without thought for the damage to the environment and the fact that the water has been over allocated to irrigation. So in the, this moment, this iconic moment, this emblematic moment, um, everyone's attention is on the drought for either three weeks or three months or, or more. It's very important to be prepared for those moments because they're the only moments that wise policy can be put in. You can be uh, campaigning away, you can be researching away, uh, but the only moments that the messages can go in are when there's a big crisis and, and then the politics change, uh, the extreme politics, and you can then push in some, some wise thing. So be doing your research, but be aware that the political moment is the one that you need to be prepared for. Well, <laughs> because of the, this incremental big moment of five or six years of drought, it was possible for the, uh, the federal government to put in place recommendations and to implement some. Uh, uh, they did a lot of science, very good science, and they actually did operationalize a policy to get farmers to stop growing rice. But in order to get that done, they had to pay farmers 300 million Australian dollars, which we've got strong in the meantime, and it's not as big as the Canadian, but they're big, 300 million to stop growing rice. So that's the price of thinking about uh, restoring the environment. Um, so water scarcity and climate change is not my big subject. Demography and a whole lot of media things are, in the short term, certainly very important. I'm never saying that climate change isn't important, but we've really got to get on with um, some other things as well. So we've got regions which are going to be at greater risk and some that perhaps are not going to be at such great risk. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about climate change. Ask me questions if you want to later on. The story of investing in irrigation, the blue water, which is the dangerous um, activity, once you allocate to farmers, they don't give it back. Once you've allocated to farmers, you get five generations of water ministers and prime ministers and, and <laughs> activists, five generations the task of getting it back into the environment, if it's necessary to have it in the environment, which clearly in some cases it is. So this is the investing in irrigation by the World Bank. And you can see something interesting was happening during the 70s. Um, 
in terms of the, the decisions made 10 years or more before, uh, but by the uh, by 1980s, things obviously were beginning to change and the decisions to allocate money to irrigation, um, to irrigation were going down. Yeah, you can see that this, this could be going up and certainly some people in the World Bank are wanting that to happen. Have you read um, the interview with um, John Briscoe in Water Policy? It's a great, he's a, uh, I'm a great admirer of people in the Southern Hemisphere in, Aust in Australia and, New, and uh, New Zealand and, and especially South Africa because they speak such beautiful English with conviction and passion and he's an engineer that does it ex extraordinary skill and he's being interviewed by Jerry Deli Pascoli uh, who's a, a famous, uh, current, he's the editor of Water Policy, but well known for his uh, work on governance and, and, um, and history of, of water investment. And uh, the, it's, it's fine because uh, I wish I could talk for five minutes, ten minutes about it, but the, the gist of it is that um, he's a, uh, I don't know whether any others in the room, but he's a, um, originally an engineer, educated at Harvard with uh, Peter Rogers, and he also then did economics, and Peter's done a lot of economics too. And economists or engineers who've done economics really do feel that they're close to God. They really feel that they've, um, they've got it all. But he doesn't understand politics in my view. Um, so uh, and he, his analysis of, of this is is because he doesn't understand the way that discursive processes go on means that he doesn't understand his politics as well as he understands water perhaps. But let's uh, just look at the extension of um, or the uh, investment in irrigation and you can see that it's been going up um, and then the food price index. Now food prices are interesting. If we were to extend this back into the far past, a thousand years, but even 200, uh, you would expect the data to be rather better. Um, the, f the price of food has been falling for a thousand years. It's certainly been falling for 200 years. So when you see price spikes, which we had in 1970, bigger than the ones that we're currently going through, and these are constant prices, and there was a bit of a bump here, which I got excited about thinking, ooh, the prices are gonna go up. And of course, my economist friend at LAC said, no, they're not. And we're in, we're now we've got another one up here now. And, but if you, and if you only show the, the graph here, and some, some awful people just put that up as if, you know, this is the only bit of history that counts <laughs> and that the rest doesn't count at all. Um, we do get the impression that we have a, a new position. But since we can see that the prices of food are Closely, well, you can't actually see it here, but it is the case. The, pr the food commodity prices match absolutely the oil price um, commodity shifts. Uh, we've got to somehow get that out before we can understand what's really happening to food. But food, I'm not saying food prices are unimportant. They are. And then just as a, um, some sense that we should get a sense of what the um, comprehensive assessment done by IMI was saying that from an environmental point of view, the other trend that's very important is that there have been some dangerous things happening to um, uh, species. But you can see also that uh, irrigation in Africa has just flashed on there, has uh, just uh, come on there. You can see that this story in sub-Saharan Africa is different from everywhere else. Now, the increase in yields are very important. In the United States, you can see um, this very interesting moment when I was saying from 1950 things did change. Uh, the United States, um, China, very good to do that for China. Latin America, very good, and Sub-Saharan Africa, obviously not so good. So, um, IPC, we get contradictory information. IPC says in some places that the yields in sub-Saharan Africa could decline by 50% <laughs> because of climate change, and it's possible more than the, the, there could also double yields in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm sure that the second one is right. I don't know about the first one, and I would say that the yields could increase by more than twice in sub-Saharan Africa, but I'm not saying it's easy. So, um, Whose ideas matter in managing water? Uh, what is ideas of science, ideas of society, on say sustainability and constructed knowledge, ideas of discursive, on discursive processes, 
um, ideas and governance processes. You're talking a lot about governance. What's governance? So the next 10 minutes I'm going to talk about governance and what we need to understand if we're to have any chance of making a contribution in the process. Um, and the ideas are important because uh, consumers are very important at the end of the food chain where they make food choices and decide to overeat or not and waste food. Uh, so we need, and society, consumers aren't scientists, they're embedded in society. So we need to understand the ideas in society. So you're all scientists, what's the role of science? To predict, explain, and to influence society. And I've become much more interested in the third one in my last 20 years. A different, now then, I wish I'd been shown this when I was 19. Uh, but it was probably, I was 69 when I came across it rather than 19. But it's a tremendously simple and important idea that there are different sorts of science. Um, the modeling sciences that predict, the social and politics theory which explains, and there's the activist science, the people that take the science from other people, contribute a bit, and then take it out into society. That's the important. I've now moved from, um, I, I never was a bottler, but I was something of a hydrologist. And the different assumptions of the three types of science, and what's relevant is different, what methods you use, what is truth. Truth is the point at which we mutually decide to seek no further. That's good for hard science as well as uh, just everyday life. Truth is the point at which we mutually decide to seek no further. It's not my idea, it's Foucault's idea, it's a great idea. Um, so what sort of knowledge observed versus constructed? Uh, you are just into observed science, society is into constructed knowledge. And constructed knowledge will always overwhelm observed science. I thought I'd come up with another truth at that point until I discovered that Marx said it 150 years ago, the abstract always overwhelms the concrete. So beware that what you're looking for, unless you can communicate it into this social process, you're perhaps wasting your time. So abstract always overwhelms the concrete. And out there in the real world, we have both uncertainty and um, uh, probability. In my, uh, if, I always wish there are, would be politicians in the room because they always give a smile and, and feel content when this, you say this. Politicians were invented uh, to deal with ambiguity, which is always associated with uncertainty. Um, modeling scientists deal with risk, uh, easy peasy risk, which can be captured with the numbers in language of probability. So, you're, you know, we're in a different league in science. Politicians are out there with the gods trying to deal with elemental uncertainty. And uh, politicians, when they volunteer to be, to be uh, know the game is about what it's about and accept the excitement of uncertainty. Most, most of us um, avoid the excitement of uncertainty. So we've got three sorts of science, um, the modeling, the explanatory, and the activist, uh, different purposes, different natures of reality, natures of knowledge, and so on. Uh, my journey has been from here, and then about 25 years, I started to find much more explanation in here. And now I know that the only important thing is to have science which can be communicated as well as possible into social processes. And just to give you an example of the difference between the two and how they can impact on water and water policy, if we think about, which I said here, uh, sustainability. Now, some people say sustainability is a rubbish idea because you can't define it. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to show here that if you, if you know that sustainability can be defined by society and by science, you can then make sense out of this idea of sustainability. So you've got some um, people who are in society uh, constructing the idea and there are other people in ecosystem science such as we've got here and even some economists doing the underlying fundamentals. So water resource use through time in a rich water country and you can see that the ecosystem people and the economists say there's plenty of water you can go on increasing the rate of use and that seems fine but then when you go out and find what's actually happening uh, in practice you know, <laughs> farmers and society have got stuck in and they've persuaded themselves that what they're doing is sustainable. So that's, we've got a contradiction. So what do we need to do? 
um, we need to have some sort of discursive political process that gets the two to converge and that <laughs> of course is done in the face of these people knowing what should be done and these people knowing what can be done and what we need is some sort of how well, IWRM has been around, and many people in the room will have heard of that term, integrated water resource management. But the problem with that was it was assumed to be a technical process. If you think it's a political process, which it is, it suddenly makes sense, because you then say it's integrated water resource allocation and management, because management is a tidy professional word, which looks as if everyone's doing their accounts honestly and well, and it's going to be good where in fact management in the case of water is an allocative activity and politicians and therefore uh, politics is about allocation of resources and the competition that uh, surrounds them therefore it's contentious is very very political and if you didn't think that IWRM was political then you obviously were in the wrong game. So what a demand uh, we've seen on the other side there is determined by consumers who have beliefs and expectations that are based on experience, cultural preferences, history, and not on science. Consumers and their, and their assumptions are very important indeed, whether they're extravagant consumers in the north, ruining their health and the environment, or optionless irrigators in the south with huge volumes of water going through their management uh, hands, and you can't tell them to stop because their families would die. So once you've allocated you into this trap that you can't get the water back. Just again to help us with understanding uh, you, this, what you've been doing here, I'm, I'm very proud to be part of your first year celebration um, and to uh, perhaps point out some of the places you might have been to. But the science discourse is, is made up of lots of different folk doing <coughs> lots of good hydrology and hydrogeology and engineering, hydraulic engineering over here and uh, environmental engineering and then when I drew this diagram I was getting into economics so I, I gave two boxes to e economics and then water and development so those are in fact the um, the left hand modeling column to some extent and these are the explanatory sciences um, everything from law to social theory to politics international relations and different sorts of law as I said so that's and we may or may not want to cooperate as <laughs> people that have been in the room that from different uh, with different affiliations may or may not want to cooperate what i've discovered i only thought of this a few years ago when i when i having messed around in these different boxes um for 25 years and 40 years and so in the first case um, i realized that the population of this box is massive like millions, certainly, you know, yes, millions of people are either formally educated in science to be associated with water, as departments such as the ones in this institute, institu this, this university and others, all across the world, and it's very, a lot of people, and another indicator is that, you know, in the water ministry, uh, water and irrigation in Egypt, there are 100,000 people, they're not all scientists, but it's 100,000 people, that's if you multiply that by you know, five, that's you know, half a million people, and then if you know, the Ministry of Housing looking after the domestic water, you know, another 100,000, so a million people in Egypt are associated with, with managing water, that's an awful lot of people. I'm not saying they're all directly in that box, but it's a big box and the science has been around for 150 years and it's, it's a strong tradition. These other boxes are uh, a few more people, but I know nearly everyone that's uh, full, full time, and there are not many full time economists doing water, most of them are part time. And I certainly know everyone in the politics and, and the international relations boxes, and they're not numerous at all, and they're not numerous in the room, are they? I'm sure. Uh, because well, there is a great hunger at this point in history, because if you put on a course called Water. Um, uh, security and governance, you'll get lots and lots of people across the world applying because there's an awful lot of people in this box realize that they need to know this stuff. So there's a huge educational, higher educational market um, in, in transforming folk that, uh, you know, my, my whole message is about you need to understand this stuff in order to understand this stuff. The, those little blobs are messages that are um, going from the boxes up into discourses. And at lunch, I was interested to hear the, um, our friend from uh, 
see uh, the Canadian uh, International Centre uh, saying exactly this. You know, ideas go into lots of different places, into a, into a big discourse, small individual discourses, we're into a public discourse now, perhaps an educational discourse, the media, so on. And once you, my idea of virtual water came out of one of these boxes here, and I said it would take 25 years to get through this stuff. And it's, we're now 18, 19 years through, and I'm very happy, as I said, that every water minister in the world and most water scientists have heard of the term virtual water and, um, and um, water footprints. Uh, but it, it is a long process. And you, if it's, it's quite likely that in this, in this complex process you lose the idea. That I'm so happy that the idea is still pretty well intact and it hasn't been messed up and screwed up. It's having a rough time in the corporations at the moment because water footprints have turned out to be too imprecise to help them do the, the things that they would like water footprints to do. Uh, but otherwise the idea of virtual water itself is still holding and no one is no one has discredited it uh, significantly at all yet. So you've got to be prepared for that if you have an idea which, which moves um, a lot of people. You've got to be patient because you know, the, the, the ear might be open or closed. If it's open and the idea goes in, it's then used in the way, not, not in the way you intended, but in the way of the, of the hearer. So this, is, this, this stuff up here is very uh, important. So, my message is you've got to understand that political landscape of where the consumers are embedded and, f and farmers are embedded with you know, farming lobby is the oldest in the world. It's not a small thing. It knows its business. Um, so and we, if we're going to put our science up, we need to be prepared to know our underlying fundamentals and understand these people explain what's happening up there. And we need to understand this science into policy process. But um, underlying fundamentals, the reason that you know, the reasonable things that you deduce from your observation uh, cannot prevail against the juggernaut of consumers' emotions. Um, this is a Canadian um, uh, cartoonist looking across the border at your American uh, neighbors. And there must be some Americans in the room, I apologize. But this is how this cartoonist in 2008, at the height of the, um, the energy crisis, saw these addicted consumers, in this case of energy, not so much water. And you can see top right, we've got the corporations screwing the stuff out of the, out of the, uh, out of the world. Now, what uh, Georgie Bush said, you know, we are addicted to, to gas and petrol. <laughs> so there they are, addict addicts. And you see, the market um, wants to please those people and give them, and it did, it gave them cheap energy for 70 years. Between 1900 and 1972, um, oil stayed at $2 a barrel. Now that's nearly free energy, that's at uh, constant prices. And that's not a market, that's an oligopoly. It was f seven majors and three governments said, we're not going to be like we were in the 1890s with this happening to prices, $2. It's nearly free. So all of us that live in rich countries had 70 years of free energy, basically. Um, and that we did us proud. We really did do lots of good things. We did stupid things like having cities do this and a whole lot of uh, you know, path dependence, which is going to cause massive problems as a consequence. Anyways, because people have got used to the free stuff, uh, they get really angry. And it means that rational decision making isn't easy. So it must be easier for leaders of authoritarian governments than leaders of US and EU economies um, because their electorates, electorates are addicted, ignorant, willful, and unforgiving at the, at the ballot box, let's say. So corporations so, uh, um, serving the addictions of society, racing to deplete the second trillion barrels. Now, as scientists, we have different ways of knowing and modeling and explaining and engaging, but society also has different ways of knowing. And uh, I'm wanting to pursue this just to make sure that when you go from here, you see that hmm, if I haven't thought of politics first, I will likely have missed the point. I was out yesterday looking at farms and we couldn't find out the value of land because we couldn't find a farmer and we couldn't ask him and we probably wouldn't have told us if he'd asked. But unless you know things like that, you can't make sense out of what's happening. So we, we, we need to know about society and its different values, and we need to know how to create shared values, which is a, a buzzword at the moment or a buzz term. Now, I've 
There, are rough, there, there can be four ways of knowing, and Mary Douglas, working with Durkheim's idea of 60 or 70 years before, spotted that there were four ways of knowing. There's everyone at, sorry, everyone at breakfast time, and then there's, there's the state and government, there's the NGOs, and there's the, the, there's the market. So citizens and voters, consumers, us, we vote and we consume. We send signals to markets, we send signals to governments. And of course, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, this stuff in here is uh, everything from taxation to the welfare state to conscription to laws, employment and pensions. You've all got your pensions and, and employment with the public sector mainly here. Um, and as, as consumers, of course, the market has been around for a few thousand years, uh, but again, mass providing massive employment and pensions and um, advertising as part of that system. So there are massive um, systems in place, blood and treasure, by the uh, ton went into this. Um, and this has been established and we're used to. Uh, the people that are of high mind, unlike the bottom liners or the peacekeepers, um, in government, uh, order keepers, um, these people only have advocacy, and yet they do point society in different directions. You can't rely on good ideas coming out of here, you can't rely on good kind of ideas coming out of here, and you sometimes get over the top ideas coming out of here, but it tends to be these are the auditors in my way of looking at things of society. So if you just think about risk, um, the state been there for hundreds of years, uh, it's a risk-managing entity. Uh, the, the, the civil society organizations, unions and others are risk-avoiding. Um, the uh, entrepreneurs in the market are risk-taking except with their reputations. So we can see what trouble we have. We've got these ad addicts in civil society. Um, we've got the corporations doing that. And we then have the governments without any options, the emotions of the consumers prevail, and the civil movements know best, but without power. I don't know if you've ever, ever met anyone that's gone to work in the World Bank who, although they're dot .org, are in fact up here. Um, the, uh, these are people that know best without power, these are the people that know best with power. And it's an, an easy move for people from down here up into, if they ever have the chance. Anyway. So just a few thoughts on virtual water footprints and how such ideas could engage with society and politics, for instance, via the press, um, in that what appears in the press is only as good as our ability to engage with journalists and the preju prejudices of the media owners. And the internet is obviously, we should, I should have three, three slides on the internet now. Um, but scientists must communicate effectively. Uh, not communicating is a crime. Um, not communicating uh, effectively is, is, um, uh, is also a crime. So we need to use the language register that, that counts to get our message across. We must expect the political landscape to be determining, and consumers are embedded in that landscape, uh, and we must expect there to be different types of governments. So if you think of that, um, that the .gov.org.com are governance. Um, this is government. This is governance. Uh, it's a bit of a simplification, but it's, um, it does get the idea across very well. And uh, we have all of those interactions taking place, and in an ideal situation we've got lots of up and down communication between the civil society and the three things that do things to civil society. But the diagram helps us to see one of the things that we must be particularly aware of, the dangerous alliances between .gov and .com, uh, where the military industrial alliance, Eisenhower did point this out in the 50s, uh, that's a very dangerous thing, it keeps getting us to war perhaps every, every few decades. But there are others, there's big, big auto, big oil, big farmer and big ag of course so and when you've got the just the interests of of these two or these people lobbying very very vigorously this then we have a dangerous situation and the dot org people do have a trouble so we do need alliances between civil society 
uh, and this other process. So the argument runs, we need all three to be engaged because we'll uh, have dangers from one and from two in alliance, so we do need the three to be engaged to have safe governance. And we can have a neoliberal pattern, such as we've got on the top left, such as ideally we would have a, a equal voices, as it were, equal like, the value given to ideas, and a common southern uh, a situation where the dot gov is much more intrusive, and an authoritarian where we've got uh, something such as that. So, oh, big ideas that society needs to know the role of consumption behavior in water, of water users. In the north about wasting water through overconsumption, we, we throw 30% of the food away, we consume in, uh, by our diet perhaps 30% more than we need. Um, and in the south we need to help people use the irrigation water um, uh, more carefully, but we can see from the Australian example that it's not easy even in a rich country. For example, if you're from the north, are you a 5 cubic meter a day person or a 2.5 cubic meter a day person? We have a choice. Uh, we can halve our water footprint by changing our diet or even if we just reduce it by 20%, that would be a help. Uh, <coughs> now, through evolution, I've, I've tried to explain why it is that we just don't value water. <coughs> why is it we don't value water? Um, well, we've had a long evolution. Um, seven million years ago, we came became you know, somewhat human. Two million years ago, we were much more human, and five, half a million years ago, we were a bit like ourselves. Uh, and we were the same size, so needing the same amount of food. Our uh, uh, food footprint, water footprint was the same. So this is um, uh, through time, we've half a million years ago through to the present, and you can see, I've tried to show how we used to be completely unaware of water, because the only water we were aware of were the three liters that we drink. Um, and that wasn't hard to find generally. And all the water, the rest of the water, because we didn't wash, uh, was in the food. And it was green water because we weren't irrigating at the time. Um, and it wasn't until, this is, a, this is a log scale on the time, and the different uses we can see. And you can see from, uh, we've got uh, primitive and the hunters, obviously bigger footprint if they're eating meat. Um, primitive agricultural, perhaps the meat uh, consumption went down and so the footprint went down and then we started to irrigate a bit uh, um, uh, 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago and then uh, we've obviously started to mobilize blue water a great deal especially in the past 200 years and the light blue is for, um, for irrigation, the dark blue is for industry. Now that looks quite an increase but from uh, so half a million years ago to now or so we've perhaps increased, we've doubled the water footprint. And that's perhaps worrying, uh, but if we compare that with energy, <laughs> it's nothing. So if we've now got a, you know, the, the trend for water moving from three to five or six cubic meters per person per day, this is the energy trajectory, 400 times perhaps. So, you know, if you think back to an emperor of Rome um, or China in 2000, 2000 years ago, they would have three or four times the energy footprint perhaps of the nearby soldier uh, on a horse as well perhaps. But now the President of the United States has two jumbo jets uh, and many fleets of cars and, and um, has a water footprint like ours. So, uh, so we have this energy is the issue and the, the link, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the link um, that between energy and water, the nexus between energy and water is something, again, I'd like to talk about at length, is something that we need to understand. Because in California, 19% of the energy is used to pump water around the state. Um, and in India, some states, uh, within India, it's, it's near 30% of the energy of the state is used to pump water around. So the, there are lots of other links, hydropower and the tar sands and a whole lot of other ways that we need to understand. And cooling, uh, we need to understand the relationship between water and energy. So, do you all use 2.5 or 5 for your food? Are you uh, an American style uh, big footprinter or a uh, good virtuous veggie? <coughs> are you a virtuous bean eater or a big beef eater? Um, these are the numbers which Aaron produced, Aaron Hoxter produced for the national water footprints. I think the China one is too low, uh, but you can see how they can be made up of different, um, um, different uh, the requirements in terms of food and other industrial products. So with, with the idea of uh, water footprints can be helpful. It would be better if we could have even more precise 
uh, information to come up with more accurate results. So thoughts and, and a question. Um, the emotion-rich political landscape is more determining than science. Uh, it's un irrefutable. It's just absolutely not in the long run, but as Kaim said, in the long run we're all dead. So it's, uh, if we're just thinking about our next 20 to 50 to 70 years, um, we've got to expect the resistance to changing direction from the path dependence that our decisions are made about the size of a city, the nature of the transportation in a city, the way we use water, the fact that we've got this irrigation stuff going on, we're going to have to deal with all of that. And that this political landscape, the opinion of farmers and society can wreck high-minded science invested, for example, in integrated water resource management. And then we should be thinking at this stage, now that corporate social responsibility is getting a bit of a bashing, that we need to think of ways of creating shared values, uh, which is on the agenda at this point in uh, this level of the debate as well as in uh, World Economic Forum levels of debate as well as um, in <coughs> the debates which I was watching last week, which Nestle, part of this food chain, um, <coughs> um, a very leading element of that, are trying to put across we need shared values, the shared values of the state, the shared values of the dot orgs and the shared values, all, the, all, of, the, all of these should share the better direction in sense of value. So I mean, key issues, we must learn to help each other. We must learn about political landscapes. We must understand consumption behavior in the North and the South. And we must enhance human resources and create jobs with high returns to water. They solve the water and food problems of the water scarce. Think of Singapore. It only has 5% of the water it needs. It has to import blue water, another 5% currently from uh, Malaysia. Then now it can easily desalinate because the technologies have changed and improved. It, it could easily do that um, itself with its own other people. The new energy coming in from outside, but it could be free of the link with Malaysia. And uh, it is perfectly, it's four and a half million people, it's going to be six million in 20 years' time. It doesn't skip, it doesn't miss a step. In, in, in industrial and social and political organization. Water does not determine. Um, human resources determine whether you have a uh, safe and secure society. Lee Kuan Yew decided in 1966 to build a pipeline for the small water, for the small amount of water needed, and to educate. So you're all part of the solution, provided you become more sensible eaters. Um, and you must do good interdisciplinary research. Just two last little slides. I was looking at you know, who should be running a country um, uh, and who should be doing science and who should be thinking about virtual water. This, uh, this article has just come out in Geophysical Research Letters, the structure and controls of the global virtual water trade network. And you can see that everyone in that uh, are from environmental engineering and civil, and, and civil engineering departments. So there are folk out there that are trying to model this sort of stuff. I, I haven't read the article, I've only read the summary, and I think they've missed the point, but nevertheless, because they should have done the more politics first, but I'll come back next time and see if we'll all have read it by then. But then, uh, who, who, who's a good person to run a country? Is it a, someone with the background of uh, your, your current prime minister, or is it the Politburo of China? Uh, yeah, you've got nine people, and you can see, um, over the, their ages, um, they're going to turn over because the system is to turn them all out and the new nine people come in uh, in a few months time or perhaps early next year but certainly I think it's this year and if you look at what they've been doing um, eight of the, out of the nine are engineers and the, the, one of the most important, the Prime Minister uh, sorry, the President, the equivalent of the President is Department of Water Conservancy Engineering. Isn't that magic? So it means that the, the top of China are people that really understand the underlying fundamentals, but they also have to do the authoritarian stuff. So politics is very complex. And you can see here the, the, the Prime Minister is also a, a Department of Geology and Minerals. And there's one economist there, and he was also educated at a, a school of, of uh, engineering. So we... <coughs> We need to understand size, society and politics first, in my view, and also the underlying fundamentals. And we should be proud of being able to communicate these underlying fundamentals 
and you know, understanding governance and managing uh, and, and, and communicating with people, you've got to realize that they may be deluded consumers who don't know any idea what the value of water is, or and certainly of the underlying fundamentals, because they're all invisible. Invisible soil water, even invisible groundwater, uh, invisible trade, invisible embedded water. So, thank you. Yeah, uh, um, I haven't looked at that at all. I, I know there are people in the room who have, have looked at it, but uh, clearly um, the industrial um, uh, side does get involved in polluting water and it does produce particular hot spots. Uh, but the, uh, it's still a small proportion of the water. It's very important in the areas where the, the environment is being damaged, but in terms of the total water... Um, that we need for our economic processes, it's still a very small proportion. But I'm not at any point saying it's not important and we need to do the campaigning or you need to do the campaigning to make sure that you keep the organizations honest with respect to the environment uh, in mining as well as in farming. Well, what we need is you know, shared values. <laughs> we need Monsanto to share the values that um, <coughs> would make sure that uh, the things that are happening are in fact good for the environment and not damaging to the environment. Uh, just quickly on, on fish, uh, you, you touched me uh, nastily because I, I, I like fish um, and uh, I tend to, at this point in my journey to vegetarian, a vegetarian position, I still eat the fish, but I eat the fish with great uh, guilt because I know that the fish is in a worse state than, than the water environment in terms of <laughs> pressure of humans um, in exploiting. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the Monsanto is clearly in the bottom left. Uh, you know, it's uh, one of those organizations that possibly doing the wrong thing extremely well. And therefore, the only way that that is going to be uh, changed or diverted or um, some shared value that is in fact not just about productivity but sustainable intensification, uh, we just have to get into conversation with those pressure groups to make sure that um, the ideas that I think you're hinting at are in place. And it's going to be a political and discursive process because Monsanto's and, and the other <coughs> seed and fertilizer people are extremely well-informed, experienced, part of uh, a new lobbying community in Washington um, that make it very difficult to have a, a, a safe discussion about it. So if you're going to in, in, uh, engage in this, it's, it's in very significant levels of politics. And in that dot-com, the um, private sector, the other thing that I just haven't had time to talk about everything, everything in the food chain from the farmers through the um, family farmers, the big family farmers, the corporate farms into, uh, into the, um, the, the, the trading people, the brands, the Nestle's and the, uh, <coughs> the Unilever's and the Pepsi's and the Coke's and the other food brands. Uh, but then the non-brands, the, those brands trade about 30% of the food that's traded, but the big uh, volumes of food are traded by the um, the ABCDs, the ADM company, the uh, Bungie uh, Corporation in New York, uh, Cargill's in Minneapolis, and Dreyfus in, in France. And those four companies are invisible. No one knows about them. I mean, there is a book written about Cargill, but no one knows about them. But they are at this point, because the, the brands have come out uh, and are... You know, just uh, they're trying to be the honest people that are trying to send messages back to farmers because they're being they're frightened of their reputation. So your rep you, what you say to how you consume and what you say to Nestle and all these other people is very important. They're listening very carefully. Uh, so, but the, 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 there's a very interesting thing happening at the moment that the non-brands are beginning to have to come out uh, from their 150-year invisibility. Um, and, and there are mighty, can you imagine, 70, about 70% 70 of the food is traded by these, these companies that are invisible. And they're uh, um, very um, respected by, by the governments because they do a good job. They, their, their margin is only 1%, uh, so they're, they're, not making, they're making a lot of money out of it, but they're turning over a vast amount of, 
a value. So it's a very interesting transition we're in at the moment. If you want to be part of the cheap food uh, and uh, other activities, it's a very important uh, issue to be caring about because the things that you're talking about are rather technical and certainly they should be stopped where they're going to be uh, bad for the future environment and bad for health. But cheap food uh, means it's cheap because someone is being in the food chain being, being prevented from having a decent living and a whole lot of other bad things are happening because of the nature of the asymmetric power in this food chain. So <coughs> and, uh, we, we do need to raise the voice so that the shared value is that the water environment is important and we can't afford to degrade it anymore and, and all the other things that you're hinting at that the, the GMOs do uh, should also be um, <coughs> out in the open and discussed.